I wanted to start this series on foldable phones with a follow-up review of the one I've been carrying since New Year's, the one that officially made foldables a thing nearly a year ago, the Samsung Galaxy Fold. But when I got the chance to spend a few days with the newest, hottest, most polarizing foldable phone in existence, well, I took a page out of Will McAvoy's book. Let's throw out the rundown. Welcome to Life on a Folding Screen, Mr. Mobile's exploration of the biggest revolution in smartphones in over a decade. Episode 1, The Four Kinds of Foldable Explained. Now, most folks don't own a folding phone yet, and for good reason. They're fragile, they're expensive, and they're so new that they're also unproven. In fact, whenever someone sees me in public with a foldable, I usually tell them, you probably don't want to buy this one. But the next generation? That might be worth a look. Now, because the category is so new, some companies aren't jumping with both feet into actual literal folding screens yet. Instead, they're making what I call foldables. Fold, build, it, it works better on paper. This is the category that's been around the longest because it's the simplest. These are phones or tablets with two screens joined by a hinge. The first time most of us saw one of these was the Kyocera Echo from 2011, followed by Sony's Tablet P the year after. The category went quiet for a few years after those failed until ZTE revived it with its Axon M in 2017. Well, I tried to revive it anyway. Until Microsoft launches its Surface Duo and Neo, the only company flirting with this dual-screen approach in a big way is LG, with removable cases like this one here for its latest V60. Now, LG has some good ideas here. You can launch any app you want automatically on the second screen, so every time you open it up, you jump right into Twitter or your calendar, and you've still got a whole other screen to do with what you want. If you want to use LG's keyboard, you can devote a whole screen to it and make your phone into a mini laptop. There's dedicated software for gaming, which I've yet to try out, but it looks pretty cool. Multitasking is obviously easier. And because there's no bleeding edge folding display, it's a more durable design. The phone half has actual dust proofing and water resistance. Thing is, I'll just look at this thing. And I'm sorry, but LG has taken a lifeless lump of a phone and strapped on a brutalist brick of a case. It looks like a shrunken netbook from 2009. And more to the point, I can just never stop seeing that seam between the screens. Dual screen diehards will argue that it's made specifically for multitasking. You put one app over there and one over here and they're meant to be kept separate. And yeah, I get that. But that argument breaks down once you admit, as you must, that you can do the same exact thing on a folding screen. That's why for me, a true foldable is the superior option. See, when I look at a foldable tablet-style smartphone, I see the product all those dual-screen smartphones are trying to be. I can run two apps side-by-side -side on my Fold. In fact, I can run three and give each one its own little slice of this big canvas. Or I can use the entirety of that canvas for one app. And if I do, I only have to put up with this little seam that I can barely see, not the big bezel gutter of the dual-screen design. As you'll know if you're a subscriber, that versatility pays off. <laughs> At this point, I think I've done four or five Galaxy Fold videos. So you've heard me talk about how the Fold was great for juggling Street Easy and Google Maps on my Brooklyn apartment hunt. How because it's almost exactly the size of an Amazon Kindle, it's my new preferred reading companion. How wonderful it is to have a tablet-sized screen when you want it that breaks down into pocket size when you don't. A word on nomenclature here. We call this broad category an innie, to distinguish them from the Huawei coming next. With an innie, the primary display folds over onto itself, so when the phone is closed, its outer casing envelops and protects it. Now that is crucial, because folding screens are extremely fragile. And it also means you need a secondary outer display to be able to use the phone while it's closed. The need to fit two screens into one half the device means the phone gets thicker or the display gets less useful. And in the case of the Galaxy Fold, unfortunately, both are true. That's a problem the Audi display solves by taking exactly the opposite approach. See, the Huawei Mate XS doesn't have an outer display on its casing. Its casing is the outer display. 
Yeah, instead of wrapping the screen in a protective chassis, it wraps the chassis in the screen. That means the Mate XS actually feels like a full-on smartphone when it's closed instead of some watered-down approximation. One-handed, two-handed, portrait, landscape, in-pocket, and out, the Mate XS is a phone you already know how to use. And then you push the button, and it becomes a tablet you also already know how to use. I gotta give Huawei credit. The polish with which it's executed this design is impressive. Sticking the cameras and USB port into this chine mean the rest of the thing can be impossibly thin, and you get a nice handle to hold it one-handed. I mentioned the Kindle before. This is an even closer analog to that e-reader. Unfortunately, the very thing that helps the Mate XS stand out from every other foldable also reinforces the fundamental truth about all foldables. Compromise. No, I'm not talking about the fact that you can't buy Huawei phones in the US, or the problems you'll have trying to run Google Apps on this device. At this juncture, I think we all understand that this is a foldable for those who don't need Google. And if you don't understand why, I'll link you to Daniel Bader's excellent article on the matter. Rather, the compromise I'm referring to is that display. You remember how I said foldable screens are incredibly fragile? Okay, now remember how I said the Mate XS's screen is its outer casing? Okay, now put those together. Yeah. Where I can just drop my fold on a table without thinking much about it, the Mate XS demands a higher level of care. Thankfully, it does come with a bumper case in the box that offers limited protection. Maybe I should have used it before my review sample developed these mystery scratches. Seriously, I've been babying this thing like you wouldn't believe, and it still got gouged. Ouch. So then maybe it's no surprise that our final category is also an innie, but instead of a phone that turns into a tablet, this is a phone that turns into a smaller phone. I could spend a whole video talking about why I love the clamshell category. And I'll give you a concession here. Yes, some of it is nostalgia. Certainly Motorola's resurrected Razer is laser targeted at those of us who wouldn't mind a quick trip back to 2005. For a few years there in the mid-aughts, almost every phone you could buy in the US was a clamshell. And that wasn't just for the benefit of those of us who privately called our cell phones communicators. It was a reflection of the fact that a device that could be small enough to pocket, but also big enough to comfortably use it, well, turns out that makes a lot of sense. So it is for the Samsung Galaxy Z Flip and that Motorola Razr. Both are innies that, instead of folding on their Y-axis, instead bow at the waist. Open, each feels like a typical, if tall, smartphone. Closed, they stow away their fragile screens inside their metal exoskeletons, collapsing down to half their deployed size. In the case of the Z Flip, you basically can't use it while it's closed thanks to that tiny external display, but you do get more functionality. You can fold the phone into an L-shape for selfies, or those video calls we're all doing a lot more often these days. So, which, if any of these categories, is right for you? Well, that depends on your lifestyle, and I do mean if any. Look, with four folding phones on shelves already, more on the horizon from Microsoft and TCL, and even a folding screen laptop coming from Lenovo, it's easy to forget that all this has happened in barely over a year. It's still insanely early to tell if these things will get traction, and at between $1,300 and $2,700 for the true folding screen phones, it's also still too early for all but the most zealous early adopters to actually buy one. But despite their many drawbacks at this embryonic stage, I still believe foldables will make up a big part of our mobile tech future. And I'm excited to explore that foldable future further, delights and drawbacks alike, in the year to come. Episode two preview. The Galaxy Fold had pretty much the rockiest start a product can have, with defects bad enough to prompt a recall and as a result, its reputation suffers even today. Well, I've carried the redesigned version of Samsung's first foldable since January 1st. How it's held up, and how it hasn't, on the next installment. Make sure you're subscribed to the Mr. Mobile on YouTube so you don't miss it. And hey, Android Central just did a boatload of articles on foldable phones, some of which came from suggestions by yours truly, because I just can't shut up about foldables. Check them out at the links in the description below. As always, no company featured in this video paid a fee for inclusion or had any editorial input or early preview of this content. That means they're seeing it for the first time right alongside you. Until next time, thanks for watching, and stay mobile, my friends.